Hello and welcome to Feminist Fridays, your weekly intersectional dose of self-empowerment and equality. I'm your host, Sarah Liberty, coming to your airwaves from Sydney. And this week we have a guest who you might remember from a previous segment. She's one of Australia's leading transgender advocates. Her name is Mistress Melissa Griffiths and she's based in Melbourne. Melissa and I are going to talk today about our shared passion for promoting diversity and inclusion online and also about how we've both experienced trolls or instances of online abuse. Melissa is also one of my board members for Just Social and is dedicated to promoting online human rights. And so I'm humbled that she and so many other incredibly diverse people support our cause. But before we learn more from Melissa, I'd like to kick off with a track by Flight Facilities featuring Chanel Therese called Lights Up, because I have a feeling our guest is going to get us lit with her insights very shortly. I should have called me to work on the album earlier, man. We could have been making some things, right? Channel Trace. Let's go. When the bass slide and that city lights up. Mm-hmm. Low high and that shit lights up. Like, uh. When the bass slide and that city lights up. Hi, Melissa. Welcome back to Feminist Fridays. Hi, Sarah. Glad to be back. (laughs) So I'd like to start uh, by asking for those who may not have heard our first interview, where you grew up and what your early influences were, because I understand that you have certainly had a journey towards becoming one of Australia's leading transgender advocates and to becoming the mistress male that you are today? Uh, well, I, I grew up in Auckland, uh, New Zealand, as a young child. 
I spent most of my life there till about 1999. Growing up as a kid, I always felt uh, different to the other girls, but back in 1980, where there was no such thing as the internet, um, and probably the term transgender may not have even been heard back in New Zealand then. So I always knew from a young age that I was somehow different and always wanted to play with the girls. And as I went through my teenage years and adult years uh, in New Zealand, um, despite attempts to bury that side of me, um, there were occasions where it came out. And I guess when I moved to Melbourne, I had a bit more freedom to go out um, exploring myself and obviously going out dressed as, dressed as a woman and did that for quite some time, hiding it from my work colleagues as I obviously had to hold down a full-time job working or doing casual work, but just going out uh, living part-time as a female. And I guess it wasn't until um, like my dad being in hospital, my cousin being in hospital, both at the same time with cancer sort of made me realise back in 2014 that life's short and to start down the path of transition. So I did that in 2015, got over all the bumps and hurdles of changing my documentation, telling work and getting through all the questions at work and lovely questions about what bra size I would have and what uh, whether I'd have a boyfriend or girlfriend and then changing your documents is uh, like getting divorced or married. It's just such a stressful process and even then the even after five weeks, I forgot things. During that time, I did uh, notify the Victoria Racing Club where I was a member of, of my transition, and I managed to influence them to uh, put it in vision and values to have uh, things around gender identity and have a gender identity policy adopted there. So I was quite proud of that. So that was something to achieve or that I achieved during that time. And then just after settling down and living for a year, I started sort of doing stuff in the media or online gradually um, and just speaking at a lady, a leading ladies event put on by Iceberg Agency, Employment Agency. So, uh, and from there sort of snowballed a bit um, and just continued on from there. But speaking on TV about Hannah Mouncey not getting in the AFL draft as a trans woman for the Women's League. So, and I just kept... I've kept going since then, right up to 2021, even during the pandemic, just doing interviews from home and speaking at various events where I can, like the 2018 National Employment Solutions Conference. And I, I spoke for International Women's Day at RMIT uh, back in 2019, so that was a great thing to do. So mm. just um, building on all those experiences and continuing to share my story, I guess. Well, before we sort of go into the online world further, you've touched on it a little bit when you said, you know, you recognise that life's too short and you just wanted to live your authentic mm -hmm. self. But when you think about how you started to talk about being transgender, particularly online, um, do you, can you think of why or when you decided to make that decision as well? I think I may, I had some coaching back in 2016, just, um, and that really helped with a friend of mine, Annie Callis, and that was just about um, working out things and things that probably needed to be sorted out regardless of whether I'd transitioned or not, just uh, around your mindset, around your way you behave and way you think as well, changing your thinking. So I went through that process and analysing situations where you might get a little bit angry and having someone outside you just to coach you, why did you get angry in that situation and just breaking it down and realising that it was rather silly, like, where's the Uber? Where, where's my Uber? You know, where's my taxi sort of thing? And why are you getting angry about it? So getting, but I guess digging deep, you know, like a deep dive into, into your life and your mindset, which is very uncomfortable and drags up a lot of stuff. So going through that process, figuring out what I wanted to do that, to raise awareness and eventually maybe one day set up a foundation to help trans people. Then I embarked on that process um, once I got through it in 2017, around the beginning of that 
by just start, starting to post a bit of my story and positive quotes online <coughs> on LinkedIn. I think in one weekend I managed to add like 380 odd contacts and one of them was Talitha Cummins and another one was Tracy Spicer. So I built connections with them. So I was lucky I, I met them. It was like I was meant to, meant to connect with them. And not long after that, I met both of them at events um, here in Melbourne and Tracy in Brisbane. So it was just like um, it was meant to be. And I just, it just kept snowballing, but I just kept putting myself out there over and over again and tried to do positive quotes as well as, as as I was trying to figure out the online world and LinkedIn and Facebook and other areas and sharing articles on trans and trans stuff, which back then sometimes I was blocked because of sharing it. Um, it that doesn't seem to happen now, but um, yeah, that was a bit of a challenge. I think Facebook has sort of changed in the last few years with regarding to uh, sharing articles around transgender issues, but yeah, in the past it has been a bit of an issue. Mm. We So we do have a few things in common. We're both bisexual, intersectional feminists who've been trolled online. But we don't judge and we've chosen to rise above that kind of unacceptable um, behaviour and uncomfortable things that have happened to us. Um, you've, you know, you've kind of touched on already a little bit about some of the ways that people have responded to you being authentic online and just showing up as yourself. Yes. Um, but, yeah, do you mind just sharing a little bit more? You mentioned, you know, you think that things have changed on Facebook, which is the biggest platform. But I think, you know, I know that you still get a few interesting responses to things. Yeah, I guess on LinkedIn when I started sharing my story, I got comments about, so I was once referred to the leading ladies um, uh, interview they they did um, with Iceberg Employment Agency. They, one person commented, oh, why don't we, referring to me, why don't we cross a pineapple and a, a, a lizard and call it a pine's art? And um, if you can figure that one out, darling, I'll send you a big bottle of champagne because I still haven't to this day <laughs> figure out the logic of that comment. It's not even intelligent or it's not even, don't even find it funny. It's just bizarre. So mm -hmm. bizarre from those, you get the other end of the spectrum, the trolls that'll just um, call you an ugly mother, whatever. And um, <laughs> yeah, so you, you get that end of it or you, know, so you see someone online say, Oh, look, James, here's a girl for you. Like, it's being sarcastic. So you, you get a, a range of... You, that's, I suppose, the negative stuff I've had. But I've, I've found the last few years, up, especially after I started sharing my story and just posting about having breast augmentation sur surgery and being open about it, and I shared it in a few um, Facebook groups like Melbourne Gal Pals, um, Strictly Gals, and World Society of Girls, the main ones, and other... Um, Facebook groups or there's like gal pals um, type groups and um, I got a bit of a following and did a video, thanked everyone for their support and everyone was really positive about it and I've continued to share in those groups, sometimes positive quotes and sometimes you don't get much engagement but that's just the way it is but I know recently when I was opened up about going to book to see a facial surgeon later this year to find out about the quotes for that and obviously uh, see the, gen the surgeon in terms of gender reassignment surgery, 99% uh, of the comments were positive. It was like maybe half of the percent of negative comments. And I think that was in Melbourne bloke and gals group. Um, and it was just blokes. But I was, um, gals stuck up for me. Most people relate to your story and um, seem to see me as an inspiration and that I show up and show my confidence and being more confident and they love my confidence. And um, so you create a bit of a following that way, which is quite interesting. And so it made me realize that, you know, inadvertently you become a bit of a role model for young women as well. Um, and that wasn't the intended consequence when I set out to, you're just sharing a story to make it easier for other older trans that, you know, don't have a voice and I know it's hard even for me sometimes. Like, you know, I was with friends last night, mm. but I've been seen for a while. I was just feeling a bit overwhelmed with everything I'm going, trying to organise and trying to organise appointments for 
it just feels sometimes it feels overwhelming the whole process and i had a bit of a cry last night and feel a little bit teary talking about it but i hadn't done that for a long time and it was almost like it was hard to cry as well because it was like something you need to do but it's just a release of what you go through and the way society reacts to you and it can be a bit of a lonely journey at times so um yeah just being authentic and sharing those things people can relate to it because they go through it too and you know just being it's just real life yeah no i I can i completely relate to it and i think you know that one of the things you've you've also touched on that i can i know about you is that you know you're um consistent in the way that you know you'll show up and you'll dedicate time to your online presence and you know i think that's why you've become to be an inspiration and a role model um it's because you put in the work as well as um you know think about what what who are you authentically um and what do you care about and what you know what do you want to share with people so but i wanted to talk a little bit about trolls and our shared experiences of them and troll hunting what has your experience of being trolled like you mean you've touched on the pineapple lizard comment um are there any other sorts of you know really strange or bizarre things that you've encountered that have made you really think what is what's going in on in this person's head they just uh I think it's just some of the general comments. Oh, are you, look at this bloke in a dress. Are oh, you a bloke? And just the ignorant comments. Um, you're not a friggin' bloke, you know. You know, you are a bloke, you know. Just, and it's just dumb. They don't even think what they're saying. Or, you're not a friggin' gal. And then they'll message you and uh, on Messenger or something and they get a bit oh. personal and... Yeah, so it can be a bit of an attack and like it. I know um, just with helping Tracy with the, some of the Me Too stuff, some stories I've heard were pretty uncomfortable to hear and what people told me in person um, remains in confidence. But, yeah, just online, just, yeah, people can be quite nasty and can be quite vicious and, you know, who like who do you think you are? You think you're better than everyone else, blah blah. blah. And, mm. You know, just oh my god, no, I'm not. I'm like everyone else. I've been paying off debts. I'm trying to figure out my transition, and it's stressful, and trying to figure out how, how I'll get the money, and I'm just like everyone else, trying to get by and make a living and make it better for other people, make a difference in the world. But you know, some people don't like that and some people are unhappy so in their own lives so then they just take it on and on me or you or anyone else that puts them out, out, out there in the public eye just to make a bit a difference in the world and the world a better place. So mm-hmm. often it's them more them than you and they're just some people are just full of hate or just hate porn. Sadly, you're always going to get those people. I mean, I, I can sort of... I can't relate. We haven't had exactly the same, the same experience. But I remember when I posted a video uh, a couple of years ago to the Australia's Prime Minister, Scott Morrison, about Australia's human rights record um, and why I found it um, disappointing, <laughs> to put it politely. I, I mean, I put it in very diplomatic terms, my video. It wouldn't have been more than a few minutes long at the most. Um, but I got some really strange responses to that. I mean, I got some good ones. I got a lot of views. And the Prime Minister's office declined to do an interview on this podcast with me, but they at least responded very quickly. Um, but I also had people commenting on the way that I looked and, you know, my lips are too big and I shouldn't be speaking to politicians, you know, with the way that I look. I'm like, what? <laughs> what's that got to do with like having an opinion about human yeah. rights you know it's very strange but I mean you know in, in 2012 it was confirmed by the United Nations Human Rights Council Council that our online human rights are no different to our offline human rights so you know to paraphrase the 1948 
uh, document the International Bill of Human Rights, we all deserve to be treated respectfully and with dignity online just as we are offline. So why do you think that someone online may still choose to express themselves in a derogatory way? And you've sort of touched on it. Um, you know, they might be unhappy in their own lives. One, you know, one response is I think people feel very more anonymous behind their screens when they're really actually not. Um, what, what are your thoughts? I think just to add to what I said um, and what you've said, probably the only other thing is they can just hide their, they can hide online, they can hide behind an unknown identity, set up a fake profile and just view their hatred or whatever it is, um, whatever their motive is, um, their strange beliefs or their very right-wing beliefs and they can do it online um, and attack who they want to attack and they're hidden. Whereas they wouldn't dare to do it in person because if they're at the pub with their mates or on a lunch, a work, work lunch, they wouldn't dare say those things. So, No, I think you're right there. Um, and, I mean, how do you think that we could maybe as a country or as a society work to better address trolling and other harmful behaviours online so that they're very real real consequences offline which is they can be distressing and they can also cause people real you know mental health concerns or anxiety um not to mention sometimes that they end up in real world violence as well um you know how could these things be avoided um Probably a few things like if you like the social aisles, the online code of conduct where there's guidelines, where there's um, you know, there's better digital citizenship so people are more aware of that sort of, of stuff and um, take, feel take a bit more pride and try and be respectful and and when they disrespect someone's opinion it's ever, and just learning to say how oh, we'll agree to disagree and moving on mm-hmm. like adults instead of being like children and continuing um, well, not because we're children, but just tr- being hateful and continuing on their rant and rave. And if they're a bit narcissistic or you know, on a power trip, yeah, just a better checking of um, when profiles are set up so that there's less of these fake profiles and better reporting so they can just be kicked off Facebook and just better guidelines around how to behave online. Doesn't mean we don't want to get to the stage where it's you can say this, you can't say this, because that's impinging on people's freedom of right, you know. Freedom of speech, speech. yeah. Freedom of speech. Also think it's, a, you know, human right, freedom to speak your mind, but do it in a respectful way. Yeah, no, I'm completely with you. I mean, I personally don't think we need a big brother type society where our online opinions are police, but I also think that people... You know, having an awareness of the fact that people have online human rights and everyone deserves to be treated with dignity and respect um, is important and also education around good digital citizenship, which means being respectful. You can still speak your mind, but know that you know, if you're offering an opinion, it might be different to someone else's and maybe have to think about how they might re- respond to that type of op- opinion before you post it or share it or whatever you do, add, add a comment on someone's profile. Um, so just quickly, as this is a feminist segment, how has feminism influenced or been a part of your journey? And I think you know, but I'm an intersectional feminist, so I believe in feminism being about equality for all. Yeah, I, I would believe in that too, Sarah. I think sometimes feminists don't necessarily like trans women. Not everyone sees trans women as women. So it's uh, interesting to observe the feminism movement and those that are inclusive of, inclusive of LGBTIQA plus people and those that aren't. So, And there always seems to be that little bit of divide in society and Australia's still a pretty conservative society that way. So... In some ways, I think it's helped transgender 
people in other ways. I think it may have hindered it in some ways because they've just um, have their own beliefs and like so. Like any group of people in society, there be differences and difference of opinion. So finally, um, where can my listeners find you, follow you? and support the amazing work that you're doing. Feel free to plug your website and your social media handles here. I guess uh, I can follow me on Facebook on uh, uh, Melissa Griffiths or one of my other groups like The Real Melissa Griffiths or Melissa Griffiths Transgender Supermodel Advice Page, which I set up ages ago. <laughs> I was getting blocked. Um, you know, I've got Melissa Loves Sydney and Sydney Loves Melissa. Um, I'm an admin for Melbourne Gal Pals Crime Solving Facebook group, so they can follow me there, or for a member of Melbourne Gal Pals or World Society of Girls or any other Gal Pal type group, they'll probably follow me there. I'm on LinkedIn, I'm on Instagram, so it's at Melissa C. Griffiths, and I'm on Twitter as well, at Melissa Racing, so I'm out there everywhere. Um, well, I think it's awesome the way that you <laughs> you manage to be in so many places online um but just being your real self as you do offline so um yeah i applaud you for your work and thank you very much for joining us again today on feminist fridays well, thanks for having me on the show sarah Have a lovely hour. always a pleasure <laughs> Well, that has been another fierce episode of Feminist Fridays for this week. But before you think about straying away, I'm going to leave you with a track by Midnight Magic called Beam Me Up. And this is the Theo Cottis remix. Because here on My Unicorn, we believe in magic. Mm-hmm.